The first talk is by Paula Mejado, and he's going to tell us about the chiral talk and the magnetic optics effect from magnetic dipole. Okay, thank you. So um, today I'm going to show you the results of a very simple experiment um, to realize a new way uh, to create a, a spin orbit coupling like the Lochinsky Moria interaction in a magnetic system. Um, so I will start with some preliminaries. Um, just remind you about chirality. Uh, uh, a chiral system is such that all the mirror symmetries are broken or are absent. And, and that fact doesn't change uh, um, in the case that uh, 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 you have time reversal. In the, when you have a magnetic chirality, that means that the magnetic degrees of freedom of your system uh, are chiral, okay? So um, chiral states can be like helicoids uh, or any winding texture like conicals. Um, and in magnetism, magnetism actually and magnetic systems, they are very, uh, they can be frequently found uh, in particular in rare earth metals uh, with central symmetric crystallographic lattices. Nowadays, um, these uh, magnetic systems with chiral uh, structures can be also in general uh, in two dimensions. And um, so it's something that uh, has been uh, happening in the last decades. So um, why chirality is important, um, uh, why we want to have a chiral uh, magnetic system or some chiral structures in a system is because um, interesting things happen. For instance, if some electrons actually pass through some uh, uh, some of these uh, winding textures or chiral textures, they will fill an artificial gate field and, and they will then uh, realize a very phase. And then that can uh, give rise to, for instance, the, the, the whole effect, right? So, um, and uh, there, there has been some large uh, uh, topological uh, whole effect um, from two-dimensional um, block type uh, chiral spin textures. And in those cases, uh, the responsible for, for those uh, uh, chiral structures uh, have been the jerochinsky moria type of interaction. Um, so now we focus on, on that one. So uh, this uh, particular spin orbit type of interaction uh, is able to stabilize um, winding textures. Uh, such as skirmions, um, chiral domain wall, or helical state, conical state, and the such. And um, what happened then is that the, the, the magnetic moment is essentially periodically wind around some uh, wave uh, vector, and the wavelength of these uh, periodicities is determined by this uh, jelochinsky mori interaction and the, the typical exchange interaction of the system. So it's the competence between the exchange interactions and the jelochinsky mori interaction which sets the, the wavelength of these um, textures. So um, we want to, to be able to control uh, jelochinsky mori interaction, just be able to, to, to create one in a controlled manner and to tune it at will. Um, because if we are able to do that, we will be able to control also the sense of rotation of these uh, chiral uh, textures. Um, so um, the, the strategy up to now has been um, combined um, uh, the broken invasion symmetry with a strong uh, spin orbit interaction. So this is the, what has been done. And in magnetic systems in particular, what you do is that you sandwich or you couple two magnetic uh, layers uh, through a metallic um, layer in order to create this uh, spin orbit interaction. So um, this is the approach um, uh, we propose. It's a very simple system. It consists of a zigzag chain. Um, the chain is made out of uh, dipoles. This is a picture of the experiment. So uh, the, the zigzag chain can be seen like a one dimensional lattice with two sublattices. So we call this sublattice, the sublattice C uh, because it orders uh, usually collinearly. And the other sublattice uh, we call P. 
The difference between these two sublattices is that um, they have perpendicular easy planes of rotation. So dipoles in the C sublattice, uh, they can rotate in the XZ plane, while dipoles in the P sublattice, they can rotate in the YZ plane, okay? So um, what we do, we place the dipoles here. Um, they are made out of neodymium. So they are hinged in this PTFE plate and they are able of rotation. This is the radius. They measure about 1.2 centimeters. This is the lattice constant for the two sublattices. This is the saturation magnetization of these neodymium dipoles. And this is uh, their mass. So uh, we place our dipoles, which are now here, it's easier. Um, and we, um, they, still, they stay still. And these ones, the P dipoles, uh, they are mounted on a translation stage in such a way uh, that they can move. Um, so if you want the lattice constant of this system, delta is fixed, but the, but the vertical lattice constant, uh, which I call L in units of delta, uh, can change. Um, so these again are the easy planes of rotations of P sublattice, P sublattice, okay? And because they are dipoles, they couple through a dipolar interaction. The G here um, um, storage all the, the, the parameters of the system, mu, mu zero, right, the permeability, the magnetic intensity of the dipoles, the lattice constant. So this is this set the, the, the energy scale. And here we have the magnetic moments of uh, any dipole at site I, which can be in any of the two sublattices. And this K can be another dipole in another or the same sublattice. And this is the, the vector that joins the two dipoles. And this is the distance between the two of them. So in order to describe each of the sublattices, uh, we define the, 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 the magnetic uh, vector. So um, it's defined in terms of a theta angle, which uh, uh, can variate. This is this variate like that for the P sublattice and here for the C sublattice. But the phi angle is going to uh, be fixed uh, in order to have the EC plane. So phi sub C is going to be zero and phi sub P is going to be pi over two, and that set the easy planes then. And we have a magnetization vector for each of them. Important uh, experimental details, the lattice has a disorder. Uh, there, are, there is some geometrical disorder uh, in this phi angle, actually, which is about 0 0.005. Um, we take into account this disorder, but there, are, there is additional disorder, there is friction, and the friction for each of the, for the dipoles, for all of them, is not exactly the same. So. Um, that will induce some, some um, imperfections in the dynamic. So um, what we do is the following. Uh, we induce dyna dynamic in the system, uh, just uh, variating this lattice constant, which I call L. Remember, this is in units of delta, so everything is non-dimensional. And this uh, lattice is kept constant. So if the two uh, sublattices are very far away, so this uh, L, for instance, is, is about larger than one, okay? And what we see is that um, the collinear uh, sublattice, the, the C sublattice, settle in a ferromagnetic collinear state, while the, the P sublattice, uh, it settles in a, in a, is in a parallel state. Uh, this parallel state is antiferromagnetic. But um, the magnetization vector uh, here, the uh, black point is the south pole, for instance, and the white pole is, the, is, is in white. So you can see that there is a, a modulation here of the position of the um, dipoles in the P sublattice. If we uh, approach P to our C, um, we reach a regime in which um, um, the system uh, can have two possible um, magnetic configuration. These are two metastable states. Um, and this is the state uh, which I call a AF square in which the two sublattices are in the, in the XY plane. Um, 
but uh, both of them are uh, antiferromagnetic. So the C sublattice is collinear antiferromagnetic, the P sublattice is parallel antiferromagnetic. Um, we can also find this other phase in which the C uh, sublattice now is collinear ferromagnetic and the T sublattice is also uh, antiferromagnetic parallel. Uh, as we decrease uh, the distance between the, the, uh, the two uh, sublattices, um, we, uh, this one is the, 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 the magnetic state which is going to be selected, which is here. And finally, at very uh, low L, um, these two sublattices settle in an antiferromagnetic uh, parallel state uh, pointing into the C direction. So uh, the first one is going to be, for instance, plus C, the other minus C, plus C, minus C, etc. Here uh, we can see uh, in the experiment there are some imperfections, and this is due to the friction. It's very difficult to stabilize the lattices when these uh, dipoles are very close because the, the, the force between them is, is, is very uh, um, uh, is very big. Um, so this is why we see some imperfections there. So we record the, the full process. So we start um, uh, receiving the, the P sub lattice from the C1. And then once we reach L equal uh, one or two, 1 1.5, we start approaching the P sub lattice toward the C sub lattice once again. So this um, define uh, a loop. So this is, for instance, the magnetization along the X direction, which is determined by the C uh, uh, sub lattice. And here we see uh, the distance between the two sublattices defined by L. So um, this is how this what happened with the magnetization as the two uh, sublattices uh, 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 become apart. Uh, and then this is what happened as they approach. So here we have this phase, uh, the antiferromagnetic phase, where all of the dipoles are pointing out of the xy plane they are all pointing into the c direction in an antiferromagnetic way here we have a phase where all of them go into the plane so it's going to be something like a spin flop transition from here to there and here we enter this metastable regime where we can find the faf phase where uh, uh, c sublattice is in a collinear fashion and the p sublattice is in an antiferromagnetic state or the one um, which both of them are antiferromagnetic. This is, these are also phases which are in the XY plane. And then we reach this twisted phase, which I am going to show uh, soon. Uh, we can also do the same with the stagger magnetization along the X direction. Uh, here you can see like uh, uh, around this point is gonna be the, the, the transition, okay, between this out of plane and in plane, uh, magnetism and here we have um, the magnetization along the C direction for the P sub lattice and the C sub lattice. So this is the way how we induce dynamic in the system and this is what we are going to study. So in order to, to, to see more clearly what happened and because uh, in that way we can also avoid friction, uh, we perform a molecular dynamic simulation. So we have uh, the equation of motion for every dipole in the system. This is um, set by the polar angle theta. So, um, so um, change in time of this angle are going to be, this is the inertia moment of if of uh, each uh, dipole, they are going to be defined by the internal torques and uh, some damping, okay. This uh, eta is extracted from experiment. Um, T here can be seen like Y, divided by V, in which, and V is the velocity at which we move uh, the P sub lattice from the C sub lattice, which is constant, and we define that uh, in the experiment. So these are the internal torques. The internal torques are going to be equal to um, the magnetization of each, of each dipole uh, across the internal magnetic field in the system. And this internal magnetic field is going to be uh, the, the, the derivative of the, the, the total energy of the system. Okay. And so again, we can see what happened as L uh, uh, increase. Okay. Um, here we have a very small um, L, this antiferromagnetic phase where all the 
the, the dipoles are pointing out of the plane in an antiferromagnetic fashion. Here we have um, something new from experiments. We can have a, a metastable state where we have this uh, antiferromagnetic state, and we have here an antiferromagnetic square. Here we have a clearly an antiferromagnetic square. Here we have the metastable phase that we see also in experiments, and here we see the twisted uh, phase once again, which as an experiment, it consists of the um, C sub lattice in a collinear ferromagnetic fashion and the T sub lattice in this, um, in this uh, uh, twisted um, configuration. And we study then the magnetization dynamic of the numerics. Okay. Um, it's very noisy at very small distances uh, because you know the, the the force between the dipoles is very large. The torque between them. Uh, we see here the metastable phases also, and we see additional metastable phases and um, the the critical uh, distances L for which uh, the transitions happen um, are very close to experiments. So um, now we want to understand. Uh, what is the origin of this uh, twisted phase that we have here? So we just take the dipolar interaction uh, as it was in the first slide, and we separate the energy between different contributions. So essentially, we take the dipolar interaction, we include there uh, the magnetizations of each of the dipoles, we massage the equations without any, um, uh, any uh, approximation at all, and uh, the dipolar interactions uh, exactly separate into this. Uh, here again is the energy scale. Um, we have um, a term here uh, which couple dipoles in the same chain, so we can call this the interchain a uh, symmetric type of uh, couple, coupling, right? Or energy, all this here. So uh, all this part here accounts for, we call it UC and UP, is the interaction between dipoles that belong to the same sub lattice. So this uh, store all the, interac the dipole interaction between the C uh, dipoles with the C dipoles, and this store the interaction between all the P dipoles with the P dipoles, where this uh, coupling is just a typical dipolar coupling. So we can call this exchange in, in, in inter sub lattice exchange. And then we have here um, another term. This term uh, is again symmetric, and it also uh, about couples um, dipoles among different sub lattices. So we can call this an exchange. Uh, an inter sub lattice or interchain exchange, this J sub AK. And this J sub AK is given here. And of course, it depends on the distance between the two sub lattices. Uh, of course, between also the, the distance between the dipoles, like this one. And finally, we find another term, um, which uh, we call U uh, sub DM, uh, because uh, it resembles a spin orbit interaction in the sense that it couples. Uh, two uh, vectors by a cross product and is multiplied by, and is this is perform a, performing a dot product between, between with another vector. So this is like spin orbit type of interaction and um, it's the same as a jelochinsky moria type of interaction. So, and this D, I sub K uh, is given here, is a vector of course, and it points along the Z direction and uh, is given in terms of L, and, and the distance between dipoles. So um, here we have um, the energy, the dipolar energy for this system, okay, which can be separated in these four terms. And we can, uh, we know exactly which is the, uh, the formula for, for each of them. So now we, we see how can we change this coupling. So, um, Using the experimental data, we have recorded the evolution of these dipoles during the whole time. So we have the angles of all of them. So we can uh, compute the energy of the system. This is the energy of the experimental system in terms of L, the full energy. Okay, And we see uh, um, um, it has a dip, and then it grows, and then it stays constant. So here is the regime where the system is antiferromagnetic square. Here is the regime where the system is out of the plane. This is the most stable 
uh, phase, and this is the twisted phase. Um, we do the same with uh, numerics, and we find the uh, same thing. Um, these are plots when we, we compute this uh, energy when the system is receding. When uh -huh. is there a phase transition between? I don't know. For that, I will have to compute all the. I haven't done that. Um, so here I separate the different energies. So in red is the um, energy between dipoles that belong to the C sub lattice. In black is the energy, the symmetric energy between the two sub lattices. In blue is the anti-symmetric energy between the two sub lattices. And P is the uh, symmetric interaction between dipoles of the same sub lattice P. So um, the use of P, um, energy of the P sub lattice alone is very small, so it's a plot here. It's one order of magnitude uh, smaller than all the other contributions. Uh, so we see that uh, the, collinear, the, the energy of the collinear state goes up, stay constant, and then goes down, but remains finite, uh, large L. Um, the dyarchinsky mori interaction actually is zero, of course, uh, the, when L is zero, and then uh, it gets... Uh, it gets a maximum uh, at some uh, value about 0 0.25 and then goes up and then goes down pardon, in magnitude and then it reaches zero in the twisted phase. Um, also, the symmetric interaction between the two chains uh, start being finite and then it becomes zero. So essentially in the twisted phase, we see that the jaloczynski morilla in the, um, energy and the uh, symmetric exchange energy, uh, they become a zero and the only contribution comes from the collinear state because this one is very small. And same thing happened um, um, for the case of the P sub lattice. So uh, it's useful to have this because now uh, we can say, uh, we can we know in which regimes, uh, which couplings are important. And also having this, we can see um, up to how many neighbors interactions are going to be to be relevant. So we can, and this is again the Jaloczynski Morilla coupling. Okay, now I call instead of L, I call it Y because we can imagine we have a, a, a long uh, system, right? Um, so here is uh, the Jaroczynski Morilla in terms of X, the position along um, the zigzag lattice, and L, the distance between the two sub lattices. Okay, and we see actually that uh, there is a place uh, where this interaction, uh, is, this coupling is going to be uh, optimized. Okay, so, um, and this is going to be in terms of the uh, distance between dipoles. So for two dipoles, which are uh, X apart, uh, the optimum distance at which the two sub lattices should be placed in order to reach a maximum anti-symmetric uh, interaction is given by this. So when for nearest neighbors, right, uh, dipoles, which belong to different sub lattices, X equal, is equal to zero, and this gives a one divided by four, which coincides with the uh, dip in the, in the, in the Jaloczynski Morilla uh, energy. We can assume um, we have a very long chain and we can integrate out along the, the, the chain, right? And we get an effective, two effective couplings, uh, which may be relevant. This is the jaloczynski morilla interaction. Okay, that one chain is gonna, uh, 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 the, the, between the two chains, and this is the, the symmetric uh, interaction, right? And we can see that while the symmetric coupling, of course, is maximum uh, when they are the, close, the, the closest, um, the jaroczynski mori interaction is not, it has an optimum. So it's not, yes, um, there is an optimum um, lattice constant between the two sub lattices that will optimize this chiral uh, interaction. Um, so uh, we can see that the system is not stable here. This is the energy landscape. Um, um, in terms of the angle of the collinear uh, sub lattice, um, this this energy uh, has been they have been uh, separated along the uh, y direction for clarity's sake, and those are com uh, computed for different values of L. And we see that about the the critical L uh, that we saw when the the 
the um, the system evolved from the um, antiferromagnetic square to the metastable phase. And uh, in uh, it actually um, about this L, we see that the the the, the barrier is going to be almost um, flat. Okay, so um, what set this uh, barrier between the two metastable states? This is set by a block domain wall in order uh, for the collinear uh, chain to evolve from a ferromagnetic into an antiferromagnetic state and vice versa, a block domain wall needs to be created. Okay, And the block domain wall, uh, um, the energy to create one of those can be compute. We know that the jalochinsky mori interaction is going to be important based in the previous slide up to uh, second neighbor, nearest neighbor. So we can safely neglect all of the other terms. And we can compute this uh, difference between um, um, energy of a pristine system and a system with a block domain wall for the case of states that are at the border, at the bulk and near to the border of a chain. And also we need to take into account that there are some frustration. Uh, there are some states um, that are going to be energetically very costly. For instance, here if we come, uh, we, we are approaching the two chains, uh, this one, uh, even so, it can be a weak link, won't, won't change because it will create a lot of dipolar energy. So taking into account these things, it's very easy to compute the width of the loop. So we can compute this, the width of the stereosis loop in the system, and it's going to be a, a function of this uh, distance between the two sublattices. So um, because we have a spin uh, orbit type of interaction, we expect to have a spin current in the system. Um, so we can uh, we can compute uh, the spin current from the Heisenberg equation and adapt it to the classical system at hand. This gives this equation here, where U is the total energy of the system, and of course this one is the internal uh, field created by the dipolar interaction with all the other dipoles. Um, so uh, this is a torque. So the torque, okay, is essentially uh, the current. Um, of this system. The torque on the spin I is going to be the, the flux, okay, of uh, angular momentum uh, transfer to that spin, okay? That's... So um, having this formula for computing the uh, spin current or magnetic current, um, we can write the, the dipolar interaction, okay, in terms of a, 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 a interaction matrix, it's a quadratic form, so we can always write it like this. This I here is a matrix which contains uh, all the geometrical aspects of this system, okay, and writing this U in this manner and using this formula, we can compute the, the spin, the magnetic current of the system, and we see that um, this a, B, C are X, Y, and Z uh, components. Um, we see that uh, in the, the 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 current of the system essentially is one. This is the Galilei Civita uh, operator, so it's going to couple uh, magnets uh, along, uh, along different directions, and the responsible for coupling those magnets in this um, matrix is going to be the jaloczynski mori interaction. So. Um, computing this, we find uh, a spin current along the C direction. The spin current is proportional to this jaloczynski mori interaction coupling, which we know exactly what it is, and it couples uh, spins in the two sublattices, uh, one, uh, the, the components along X of the collinear or C sublattice, and the components along Y of the, of the P sublattice. So um, we have a magnetic current in this system, which is induced by this jaloczynski mori interaction. Um, so in the antiferromagnetic square phase, this is the planar phase where two of the, the two sublattices are in the XY plane and the two of them are antiferromagnetic. Uh, we can write uh, this spin current in this manner, okay? Um, and remembering uh, uh, that the, in, in the antiferromagnetic square phase, okay, we don't have a, a, a coupling, a, a symmetric coupling between the, the, the C and the P sublattices. We have that the, the full energy of the uh, antiferromagnetic square phase is given by, by this formula here. 
just writing it in a different way, where this J sub A K P P is the is just the exchange constant uh, in the same chain P, and this J sub A K C C is minus two times that. Uh, so doing that. Uh, we can also write, we can take this, okay, and write the, the, the energy of the antiferromagnetic square phase in this, in this manner, where this term, this G sub AK IB cosine of I sub AK uh, is given by this term here. So uh, using this energy, once again, we can uh, compute the um, spin current using the previous formula, and we find that the spin current actually can be written in this way. So, because we have this fellow here, that means, and this is proportional to the um, Jelochinsky Moria uh, um, vector. Um, that means that the Jelochinsky Moria vector acts in this case as a vector potential or a gauge field, which is associated to the magnetic current in this system. Um, so we can go a little bit further. Um, so um, we have then uh, uh, an effective uh, jelochinsky uh, morilla interaction, right? Uh, we can, oh, oh, can be exact or can be effective, whatever. This is the nil vector of the P sub lattice. Again, this is the jelochinsky morilla vector, which we know exactly what it is. So, um, so we can define a magnetic flux. And uh, this magnetic flux, is going to be equal to the Jelochinsky uh, Morilla um, uh, field, which uh, points along the x direction, dot uh, uh, a surface A. So we have here our system. Um, we can define a, a, a loop here, S, uh, which has a length equal to 2 pi y, for instance. And this loop has an area, which is pi y, y, x, and points along the x direction. So this loop lives in the YZ plane, right? And we also have the uh, um, jelochinsky morilla field, which point along the X plane, right? Uh, the X direction. So we have this magnetic flux and um, we can derivate this magnetic flux um, by Faraday law, uh, we, uh, we, 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 we find a FEM. This is a jelochinsky morilla FEM, right? Which is uh, going to be defined, uh, which is equal, just derivating this, we have the expression for that, right? Uh, two pi V, V is the speed at which the two um, sublattices are moving apart, Y, and this is uh, multiplied by the effective Dirchinsky body interaction at linear order in Y, okay? So this uh, FEM is going to be proportional to the integral uh, over a, a closed uh, loop on a um, electric field, right? So we can just replace what we found here and we can obtain an electric uh, jelochinsky morilla or an electric field, an effective electric field due to the chiral couplings in the system, which is given by, by this expression. And, and then we can find, we can write the the, the energy of the system in the antiferromagnetic square phase. Now we replace this H in terms of E that we found in the previous slide. And we have an energy uh, of a magnetic system which has an E uh, vector there, an electric field vector. Uh, so that means that if we just derive the energy of the system respect to the E vector, we identify an electric polarization. So here we see a manifestation of the magnetoelectric effect in this system, product of this uh, effective jelochinsky morilla interaction. And finally, we explore a little bit uh, the winding texture. Um, so I will go a bit um, fast here. So here I am changing um, L, um, L equal almost two, then <coughs> one, uh, 0 0.9 and 0 0.8. And we see uh, this is the magnetization um, of each of the dipoles in the system, uh, we see actually that it has, it goes up, down, this is along the Y direction, this is along the Z direction, okay, and so we see that actually this texture evolve I, as I am moving the two um, uh, chains uh, apart. Um, we can define an ill vector. Now we have this texture has 
uh, uh, is a field, right, uh, which depends on x and l. We define the nil vector, uh, and we minimize the energy considering also that the Jalochinsky Moria and the, uh, the symmetric energy are zero in the regime of the winding texture. Um, to find a solution for this texture, um, this solution is a soliton. Uh, so uh, essentially what we are finding here is that the jalochinsky moria interaction is able to stabilize uh, solitons or twisted textures in the system. Um, many things to come. The solitons, they have conservation law. Um, we have the continuity equation, right? This is the, the, the topological charge and the, 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 uh, and the topological current, right? And this, they fulfill um, the continuity equation. Um, in real materials, we can, uh, we can uh, assume that there are some um, uh, crystal fields which are going to induce dynamic of the system. So we can study um, this Hamiltonian density now in terms of our nail vector here. And um, where we know that this A exchange is going to be proportional to uh, J in the same sublattice. And this is a susceptibility, which we know is going to be proportional to the Jalochinsky Morilla interaction. And here we have uh, this K, which is going to be an, is an, an isotropic term, which is going to be proportional also to Jalochinsky and to the symmetric exchange. And this M can be uh, the transfers, um, uh, the transfers uh, magnetization vector. So we can, um, um, we know that the, our texture and the transfer motion, they are um, um, uh, conjugate variables. Uh, so they satisfy the, the Poisson bracket. So we can induce, uh, we can find or figure out the dynamic of the system just solving the, the Hamilton equation, uh, ignoring damping for now. And we arrive to assign Gordon equation, which has actually the solution, a soliton, which um, you know, is, is, is a domain wall, which is going to have some um, um, width, which is going to be given by the ratio between the, the symmetric coupling in the same sublattice and the anti-symmetric and symmetric coupling between sublattices. And it's going to have a spin wave, spin, which is also be proportional to, um, to the symmetric coupling in the same sublattice and to inter-sublattice couplings. So, um, uh, I finish with this. So the dynamic of a zigzag lattice of dipoles is induced by the intrinsic interfacial magnetic torque, uh, which arises due to the interchain dipolar magnetic field. Um, the static dynamic of all the magnetic observables in the system is propelled by interlayer, interlayer gap variations. Um, uh, we can think of that like strain, uh, for instance which tuned intrinsic torque and interfacial Gelochinsky uh, Morilla in the absence of any external driving force and induce an electric field and allows the manifestation of the magnetoelectric effect. And we have that this uh, winding texture in the system is stabilized by the internal Gelochinsky Morilla interaction. Thank you. So, um, how do you consider the periodic boundary conditions for this long range interaction? I don't. I don't use. I don't use periodic boundary condition. I um, I, I solve the the molecular dynamics as it is for the same system with thirty seven dipoles. Maybe you already mentioned what are in the experiment, what is the physical dipole? What is the what? And you showed the physic, uh, experimental uh, figure. Yeah. What is, the, what is the dipole made up of those physic, physical dipoles? The dipole. Yeah, what? Yeah. Magnetic. Uh, magnetization, um, the saturation magnetization of each uh, is about 10 to the 6. Is, um, There. Yeah, like what are those material? Is is what, what is that thing? Individual dipoles. Oh, those are those are each of them is a dipole. 
magnet? It's a magnet. It's a magnet. Okay, physical magnet. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. It's a physical magnet. Okay. Yeah. This is a picture. Yeah. It's a physical magnet. You can buy them. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Amazon. Any more questions? You don't have the photo of this magnet? Well, yeah, like, they are like this size. Okay. We are theoreticians, so it's something <laughs> bad that like we cannot imagine. Is that they are like this size or you know, they look like that essentially the same. No, no, they come like that. No, because this is okay. This is like the this is like an acrylic plate where and this is the magnet. And this is a piece of graphite that allows the rotation of the magnet. This is painted with a pen like black to be able to, when you record it, to distinguish one pole of the other. Uh, what? So, this is the radio of this, all of them. They are cylindrical magnets. This is the length, and this is the lattice constant. So, the distance between this and this. And this is the saturation magnetization of the neodymium. Okay, which is given, and this is the mass, the mass of each of them. Since it's one, one day, do you expect phase transition? Where do you want to find phase transition? I mean, you're showing different phases, so that's... Um, yeah, but phase transitions are useful if you want to find something of the system that you cannot find any other way. I mean, it may have a phase transition, but um, I just see a, a phase change. Um, okay. And temperature is not important here, right? Because these magnets are massive, so temperature won't do anything to the system. You can assume that this is done at zero temperature, right? So um, probably if there is a, it may be a first order one because you have a hysteresis, right? First order um, usually are not that interesting. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Paula. Okay, thank you.